muscle in there. But there's enough muscle to cause it to curl, kind yeah. of like this. Yeah. And when it makes that curl, as a baby, these little fringes, which are actually a little bit bigger than the babies, help like fingers to grab around the mother's teeth to form a tube so that when it's nursing, the water is channeled through that tube and into the mouth so the milk is not lost to the ocean. And so far, have, we f have you found anything in terms of any, any possible reasons for death? Not yet. I can't believe that you are inside the <laughs> mouth of a whale. Okay. There you go. I don't want to lose you inside know, it yet. Really There's still a lot of work Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> now you know why I like these pink boots. It's two hours since the dissection team started, and they're still struggling to remove the whale's skin. The digger's just being manoeuvred into the right position now to be able to have the right angle of pull on this blubber, and because ideally what wants to happen is rather than trying to pull it out at right angles to the body, it wants to pull it longitudinally, like just peeling back that banana skin. If the rope pulls through, the only alternative is uh, with us with knives is to actually hand cut it off, which will take probably an hour and a half. And the tide will be on the turn and coming in any moment, so uh, that would be a serious disaster. This is going to be dramatic. Go for it. The team can now finally investigate the internal anatomy, and they'll begin with the guts. They need to take them to the shore, where they can examine them in detail. Their contents may yield vital clues about what led to this animal's death. But the difficulty is trying to, not only is it heavy, but I mean, typical of, of intestine, it just wraps in amongst itself. I guess everybody stopped breathing through their nose in the last no, while. Huh? We need to do something to get away from here because when the tide comes in, it's going to sling it all around. We're we organising our container to take that and all our internal organs, right? Store them up at up the shore line. Okay, look how much we got done so far. It's not sunset yet. <laughs> Joy has one other thing she wants to do before the tide comes in. For her, the holy grail of whale anatomy is understanding how whales talk to each other. And there's a vital bone called the hyoid that she's determined to reach, even if it means diving down the whale's throat. It's shaped just like a wishbone in a chicken. But pulling this wishbone out of a whale is a much meatier challenge. The hyoid bone is a free-floating bone in the neck. It's not really attached to anything else in humans. In whales, the hyoid bone is attached to the skull. So this is going to be a hard bone to get out. Can you pull it down now? This is the epiglottis. It's the beginning part of the larynx. The larynx is the voice box itself. That's where the sounds are produced. And this bone is still attached to the larynx, so when it moves back and forth, it moves the larynx as well. Many whale calls are so deep, they're beyond the range of human hearing. It was only during the Cold War, when the US Navy took microphones into the ocean to listen for Soviet submarines, that humans heard the full range of whale sounds for the first time. But what are they saying? 
They might say I found a really cool patch of krill. Come on over here. It's a food fest. The puzzle for Joy is how this mammal's voice box adapted to work underwater. To explain her theory, she wants to dig out the larynx and the hyoid. As the sun sets and the weather turns bad again, the odds are not looking good. taking hold of our dissection. It's now hailing, it's gone incredibly cold again. Obviously we're losing the light and the tide's coming in. You can see the team still at work. Over there's Joy still battling to try and get the hyoid bone and the larynx out. And this digger's trying to get out the liver because it's a huge structure. We want it out of the way so they can ac access the big diaphragm separation between the abdomen and the thorax or chest. And if they can get through that, Curtain a muscle, that's where the heart will be, and hopefully that's what we'll get at tomorrow. But we've got to be leaving soon because otherwise we won't get off this beach. At last, Joy wins her tug of war with the monstrous wishbone. But the hyoid snaps off the larynx. One last shove, and the larynx is hers. Despite driving rain and fading light, Joy can't resist an impromptu tour of her favorite organ. That's the voice box called the larynx. This is the front end. That down here is the epiglottis, the front part of the larynx. It's a little bit shredded right here. That's the opening in that air would take to get into the larynx. These are the corniculate cartilages and they have these interesting flaps on them and it's not clear whether these animals pulse these flaps because females actually do make pulse sounds. So these might be part of the sound producing apparatus. If we follow the air through and go around to the back again, where it's coming out in the back right here, you'll notice that as you look through that hollow space, if you can see the light coming through, where I'm putting my hand, it goes into a cleft. And so as it goes through this gap, this sac is probably responsible for bringing those sounds out to the outside world. So this sack can really balloon out and take a lot of volume in it. As this bag distends, it pushes on those throat plates, which are like an accordion. They can expand and contract. And that in turn would send the pulse into the water directly. And these animals are making low frequency sounds. So the bigger this is, the lower the sound. Oh, oh, yeah, I knew that was gonna happen. There it goes. <laughs> the tide starts to turn so they must shut down operations for the night. Their big worry is that when the tide returns, it could turn the whale over and fill the carcass with sand. It's day two of the fin whale dissection. Tell you what, what a difference 12 hours makes in the weather then. Unbelievable. Today, the sun offers some reprieve from the notorious Irish weather. It would be great to try and find the vestigial hind limb, which would be good. It's female. It's even a possibility it might have been pregnant. While we're waiting for the tide to go out, the job we can do now is all the bits we harvested yesterday, the digestive tract, the intestines. We can have a detailed look at that. A bit of tape around the top, please. Do you get used to this smell? Oh yeah. yeah. This doesn't smell nearly as bad to me as uh, simple things like, you know, changing a baby's diaper. <laughs> Joy now wants to check whether the whale had eaten just before it died. First, they must untangle the guts. Somewhere underneath here is the stomach, which is the beginning of the track, so we need to flop some of this over to get down to the stomach.
The intestines are over 80 meters long, four times the length of the whale. The food is coming in through the stomach, which is all the stuff on this side of me. And then it's going to run through the small intestine, which is this stuff that's looped back and forth all the way down the tarp. And then as it comes around the corner down to the end, that is the large intestine ending up at the anus. This is stomach. Okay. This, this is a really Hang on, do large... <laughs> so we can pull it. We need a bit of help here. There you go. Let's make another hole. Here, here's one right here. Pull. We can pull it this way, we might feel better. Perfect. We're looking at the beginning of the stomach, one of the chambers of the stomach here. If the animal had eaten, this is where we would first find food. But we're not seeing anything in here except fluid. So this indicates to me that the animal was probably sick because it wasn't feeding. This would be the next chamber. Want to get a sample of that? Even though fin whales are fish eaters, they have a multi-chambered stomach similar to a cow or a hippo. 65 million years ago, the sudden extinction of the dinosaurs opened the door for mammals to become the new giants of the planet. One group of hoofed animals became the most successful plant eaters with over 200 modern species. Buried within this group, next to hippos, is the ancestor to all whales. It was the size of a wolf, armed with sharp teeth, but it had switched to a diet of fish. This was Pachycetus. It would evolve into the toothed whales, like dolphins and killer whales, as well as the biggest mammals of all, from the baleen whale family. It's interesting, isn't it, because you tend to think about the fact that, you know, everything we've talked about with the whale is that it's perfectly adapted for its environment, but actually it's got all kinds of handicaps associated with the fact that its ancestry was on land. Right. So it's still not perfect by any means. You know, if evolution were intelligent, we wouldn't have these handicaps. Yeah. It's not. It's a mishmash. It's a patchwork. Every time you want to make a better mousetrap, you put another patch on. You have to work with what you've already inherited. You always have evolutionary baggage. It makes you think, though, doesn't it, in the very long term, in the future, would you end up with this evolving into an animal that then moves more to, being a, to, to having gills or being able to actually extract oxygen out of the water rather than having to breathe like a, a land mammal? You could never make those predictions because evolution isn't that. directed. Yeah. And you never know what the environment's going to do because it has to respond to how the environment changes. Who knows what changes are going to happen? <laughs> Maybe global warming will cause our whales to evolve into something else. But when whales took to the water, their swimming style was already set. Unlike fish, which have a spinal movement that goes from side to side, whales propel themselves with an up and down motion. Their ancestors had turned galloping over the land into galloping through the sea. But this didn't just mean swapping legs for a tail. Joy thinks the hyoid bone she extracted yesterday from the whale's throat may hold the key to how whales swim. Just like a human swimmer might do the dolphin kick, you know, the dolphin kick isn't just kicking your feet. You have to have a whole body wave that begins with your head and moves up and down. So the initiation, the beginning of that swimming motion must start with the head pulling down and then up. So pulling up is easy. There's lots of muscles in the back that pull the head up. But the muscles in the front, most of those are gone because these animals have to expand those huge throat pleats when they're feeding. 